Hello and welcome to the Alvin Rosenzweig Show. I am very uh, delighted to have you here with us today uh, to be watching and to be listening. It's a very unique show, and it is. My guest today is y Yair Moses. Yair, how are you doing? I'm okay considering the circumstances. Thank you. So, right. So let's let's talk about those circumstances. And firstly, I want to thank you very much um, for being a guest on my show today. It means an awful lot to me. Thank you. Yeah, years father Gadi is 80 years old. He's an Israeli and he was kidnapped on October 7th. He is currently a hostage in Gaza. Now this story continues. Margalit is Yair's mother. On that same day she was taken by Hamas terrorists into Gaza and she was held there until November when a number of hostages were released. Efrat is Gutty's, was Gutty's uh, partner in life. She was murdered on October 7th on the way to Gaza. Similarly, Efrat's daughter, Doreen Katz Usher, was visiting for the weekend, and she was there with her two kids, Raz and Aviv, two and four. They were taken into Gaza as well. So this story is a very complex one, and it's a very tragic one. And hopefully, God willing, it'll be a story of redemption earlier uh, than later. So once again, Yair, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm grateful. Thank you for having me. So how are you doing? How are you feeling? It's very hard. We're living now more than eight months of, of living hell, you know, um, I, both me and my wife, we didn't go to work since October 7. I, since my life stopped, I didn't shave my beard. I didn't cut my hair. Usually I don't wear this huge beard. It's, it's just my life stopped. And this is a symbol to the whole world that my life, my life was stopped. And I didn't shave. No one imagined that it will take so long that I will be back. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's getting hard. So I'm getting it off because my life didn't come back to the area usual. So what, what are your days like nowadays? How do you spend your days? Um, basically, we're just we're doing something for for uh, to shout for their name, for their voice, because their voice cannot be heard. It's going to interviews, going to podcasts like this, um, TV. Uh, sometimes we go to rallies. Sometimes we participate in, in March or whatever there is. There, there are many, many activities in Israel around the world. I've been uh, outside Israel already five times since October 7 in, in uh, delegations to to tell the story, to shout for the name, and to everyone will hear that uh, what happened, and it's still happening. It's not just up, something that happened eight months ago. And this is the important thing. Our life and, and the life of another 120 families are stopped, and we're trying to do whatever we can in order for them to, to be back. Yeah, yeah, where were you on October 7? I was in my house with my family in a city called Gedera. It's um, in the south of Israel, but not close to the border with Gaza. And like uh, half of Israel, I think, we woke up to the sound of sirens in 6.30 in the morning. And we rushed to the safe room. Unfortunately, all houses in Israel have a safe room or a nearby shelter, because this is our life for the last 20 years, that from time to time, uh, you need to, to hide from uh, rockets that come from Gaza shot at civilians and we did the we waited sometimes in the safe room and then we had to, to we, get, we went out and called my parents and, and asked them are you okay and said yeah we are in, in our safe room everything is okay don't worry and uh, we started to watch the news and we heard that more and more sirens and everything and slowly slowly we understood that this is much worse than anything happened before and because of that uh, we started to listen to the news and started to hear news about terrorists that came inside Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw some photos in, in TV, some, some movie that was taking from the road and of Hakim and other places. And, and then we heard that they're also in uh, Niroz. And, and also we are instructed to say that don't, don't call them because they're not allowed to talk because terrorists might hear them, you just text them. So we started to text them and ask them how they are. And around 9.30, we lost connection with both of my parents, each one in his house. house. Um, 
not much later, um, a friend of mine called me and said, uh, do you know the rumors that your father was taken by, uh, by the terrorist? And I said, no, I didn't know it about it. I didn't hear about it. Uh, later, we learned uh, after the Ron came back that uh, when the terrorists came inside their house, my father left the safe room and went to the terrorist and told them he's the only one in the house. And, and that same group took him and went away. Uh, he sacrificed himself for, for a frat and a daughter and two granddaughters. But unfortunately, later another group came and, and took them too. And the frat was murdered on the way to Gaza. Uh, but he, he was a hero. He sacrificed himself for them. He didn't think twice about it. He, he knew this is what he had got to do and this is what he did. Um, Does it surprise you that your father responded that way? No, I'm, I'm not at all. This is the many he is. He's always want to help to protect others, to do whatever he can in order to to help others, to to make others uh, better, to improve people's life. This is my father. This is who he is. It was not surprise at all. We know he is a person like this that will do that. What well, what did you do after you found out the news? Well, at the beginning, we couldn't do much because it was a war zone. You couldn't go inside the car and, and go there because you, we heard from the people that are talking that uh, if, also if you have weapons and you know people with weapons drove there and some of them managed to help, but others helped others and, and, and got killed at the end because the number of terrorists was so big that it was impossible to, to go there without a, a huge army force. Uh, so we just had to, to wait and talk between our brothers and everything. Uh, during that same time, my sister was also in another house in the kibbutz, and in kibbutz Niroz, and she was in her house. Uh, from some luck, the terrorist uh, shut the lock of the door of their of her house and couldn't get in, and just move on, and didn't burn the house or bomb it or like they did in other places. In in kibbutz Niroz, which is a very small community of 400 people, um. 117 people got murdered and killed that Saturday. Yeah. Quarter More than a quarter of the population. 40% of the houses were burned to the ground. And actually only six houses, uh, my sister luckily is one of them, uh, the terrorists didn't go inside them. So all the other houses, they came inside, they broke things, they, they shot people, they kidnapped people. And later came another group of uh, people from Gaza and, and and stole whatever they could. Just a mob that came and 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 did whatever they wanted in the kibbutz. Women and children too, not just uh, men. Have you visited the kibbutz since? Yeah, I've been there several times uh, since then. It's uh, it's terrible to see the place that uh, I was born and and grew up in. And and uh, for me, it's a paradise. Uh, paradise it's it's the edge of the desert of Israel but the place is very green and and you know you know every corner it, it's it's the place I grew up in until my late 20s this is where I lived and to see all the the burned houses and and the at the beginning though still we I, I got there about three or four weeks after and still there was a smell of of the smoke from the places and and the destruction is, is terrible it's, it's impossible to imagine how cruel, how vicious people are. When you went into you went into the houses, uh, your father and your mother were not together. They were separate. <clears throat> did you sit there for a long time? Were you quiet? What did you do when you went into them? Yes. Uh, lucky for us, both of their houses were not burned. They just, uh, just been robbed and, and everything was all around the floor. And they looked for money, jewelry, or, or just destroyed, broke things. So... Yeah, we just observed it, and and uh, and and you know you can't imagine that these people will will do this. It's not, I'm you know you need to think. On my father's house, at the first picture we saw, we saw something red on the on the floor, and we are afraid it might be blood. But later, we people updated us. It's just a, a bottle of wine that was broken. But the, the first picture are very very frightening. That you see a lot of red liquid on the floor, for example. Uh, but yes, we we just stood there and and tried to imagine what happened and and uh, and when the first time I was there it was before my mother came back, so both of them we, we just hope that they are okay and and try to to believe that they have the power to, to hang on until they will be back. How did you respond to that situation emotionally? Did 
Uh, do you see yourself as a strong man? Yes, yes, I can. I, I do myself as a strong man, and I think pretty fast we got to a situation when we are uh, trying to be focused. Okay, what we're doing now, and and you don't know what you can do because uh, you try to call the, the the army, the police to see what what can be done, uh, and and only at, at the same day, October seven, at the night, we realized that they are not there and they are really, and we believed, assumed that they were kidnapped. Uh, we didn't know for sure. And it took a few more days until the army came to us and tell us officially that they were kidnapped. <coughs> so it was a, a very, very uh, anxious day. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit absurd to say, but uh, I was happy to hear that my parents are uh, kidnapped because it doesn't mean they are lying dead somewhere. So it was a very... Um, you know, it's something if, if you would say that a year ago that, yeah, my father is, uh, is kidnapped by Hamas, no one would say it's the happy news, but for us it was the happy news because the other option that they are lying dead somewhere. So, yes, it was a, a very, very hard day, very difficult days that they didn't stop since. Uh, we did have a few happy days when my mother returned, but beside of that, it's a, it's a struggle. It's an everyday struggle to believe that he's strong, he can hold on, and you try to do whatever you can in order to world to hear his voice that no one can hear. Yeah, you're, what what is it like to process um, a, the kidnapping of a number of different people in your family versus those who have one hostage, family member as a hostage in Gaza? How do you do that in your head? I don't think it's matter. It's if it's one people or five people or six people. I don't think it's matter. It's it's people that are there. And you know nothing about them. You know, you don't know if they're even what their condition. You don't know if they're wounded, if they're sick, if they get the medicine. You don't even know if they're alive. We don't know anything about them. And and I don't think it's it's different if it's one people or, or more. It's uh, the fact that one someone from your family is there kidnapped and hostages. Uh, that that it's enough. I think it's enough. Let, let, let's talk about your family members specifically now. Your mother, Margalit, um, she's a biologist, a musician, and a peace activist, right? Yes. She's, she seems to be quite an amazing woman. Uh, there are stories told about her already that when she went into Gaza, she went in and she herself decided she was going to be very calm and very focused to the extent that as she was being kidnapped, she asked the kidnappers if she could change out of her, her, her uh, night dress, as well as if she could take her CPAP with her. D yes. Does that surprise you at all that she approached it that way? Um, a bit, because I know she, she can... It's not surprising that she did it. I, I was surprised that they allowed it, and I was happy about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah but, but she said, uh, she told us, uh, the minute they opened the door, I realized it's not... You know, the, the safe room door is not uh, built against people. It's built against bombs. And she knew she don't have the power to hold the door against them. So the minute they opened the door, she understood she's she they're going to take her and she told them. And I think it was lucky that we, she she knew a bit Arabic. So she told them, I will come with you, but just let me get organized for a minute. And 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 because she was uh, not not fighting with them, I think this is what allowed uh, allowed them to let her do it. Uh, because she said, Yeah, I will go with you, but give me a minute to, to change uh, and then to take everything with her that she needs. Um, she didn't know what will be later, but lucky for us, also the people that came inside the, to her house were not violent people because we know in other other places, as they opened the door, they just, first they hit the, the woman, also someone, a very um, adult lady, that first they hit her and then they started to talk to her and took her. So lucky for us, the people that came inside her house which are terrible terrorists. Yeah, I don't can I say anything uh, good about them, but I, the only thing I, I said that lucky for us they weren't violence against. Them. How does your mother know Arabic? Uh, we don't. We, we, when they live in this area, we used to work with them a lot of times, so she learned some some basic Arabic. It's not that she talks fluent Arabic, but many people in Israel know some words and and can talk and and. Uh, and, you know, we had a good relation with Arab people. There are people that live in Israel. So it's not something that's not common in Israel that people know some Arabic. Do you know Arabic, some Arabic? 
Uh, very, very basic that I learned back in school and I, I cannot speak. I don't I know just a few words or something like this, uh, much less. My mother knows uh, more, lucky for her. Yeah, you, you talk about having a relationship with many Arabs, uh, many people who came into work in the kibbutz and other kibbutzim in the surrounding area. The narrative that's come out of October 7th is that many of these people were instrumental in providing uh, uh, you know, information to Hamas, which allowed them to know where to go on that morning. What's your take on that? It, it's terrible to believe that people that, you know, we, we let them come, we let them work, get salary. Uh, many of them, you know, maybe not in the recent, in the last years, but in the past, many of them, people had relations with them and came to visit in their houses and everything. Look, when I was a kid, there are not even a fence in the border between Gaza and Israel. Yeah, it just uh, people used to go to the beach of Khan Yunis in with a tractor, just like this. So the situation got escalated from time to time and got worse and worse. But uh, in the past, uh, the people had good relation between them and work relation, and even some personal relation that they called friends. These people, and this is what was very very hard to to many people because. The people that you call them my friends here, yeah, we know that they gave me a lot of information that allowed this to happen. What well, what is that mentality that allows a person to do such a thing? I cannot uh, talk for them. You know, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. it's it's impossible to understand uh, why they did it. Maybe they were forced to do it. Uh, I would like to believe that, but I'm not sure this is the right thing. Um, I don't know. I cannot explain uh, why why someone that. Uh, was uh, and, and and everyone that came to work at least in roles, but I know in the other kibbutzim too, uh, it wasn't like a second degree person. He was treated as equal to everyone and got his salary in time, got everything, and and people saw him as friends. Many of the people indeed saw them as friends, and this is very very hard to a lot of people to, to even to think that people that came to their houses and everything now they they told uh, Hamas everything that allowed them to do it. Your mother said that when she was being taken hostage, that she went through or she saw the beach in Khan Yunus where she used to swim as a kid, which is what you were mentioning before. No, no she wasn't swimming there as a kid because uh, she didn't grow up in, the, in this area. But yes, she was there as a, she knew this as the area because we used to, go, when I was a kid, we used to go there. She knew the roads. When, when uh, she came back, she knew. She knew to tell everyone exactly the same roads that she was taking until she was inside the small street of Khan Yunis. But until that point, she understood all the way that she was taking there. Yeah, because we used to go there. It was yeah. been yeah. yeah many years before. Uh, I, I believe it was before the 80s because uh, I, when 80s started, it got started the, the first intifada and everything. Then things much more escalated. But till then, yeah, we used to go there. It was people used to go there a lot. It wasn't even uh, it was safe and 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 clear and everyone he went there did your mother tell you a lot about what happened there yeah she told everything that happened during the time she was there she she told the whole stories uh, the, about the condition about the food they had about um how they treated them how they managed to sleep she told us uh, all the stories uh, uh, for example you know you told us about the, the sip ups that she managed to take but uh, when she was inserted into the tunnels and my mother spent the all 49 days that she was there in the tunnels underground and uh, they took it from her even though they knew exactly what it means and when she needed it and and when she got into the tunnels a group of, of people were taking into uh, into the doctors and and she told them i needed to sleep because when if she's sleeping without it it's it's dangerous for her life and the doctor told her, so sit on the chair, lay your head back, and this is how you should sleep. And, and before that, she barely slept the whole 49 days. You know, from time to time, it grabbed a few minutes to sleep because when eyes closed, but she didn't really have the proper night sleep all the time that she was there. What did she tell you as to what she did during those 49 days? How does one fill up the day? Well, she, she said that she, she believed that she will be released and she tried to be as active as possible uh, in order to give meaning to her time there so she like i said she was group with a group of uh, elderly men that needed some help so she helped the others uh, physically when when it was needed uh, she was uh, 
they're singing words, singing song together, playing word games. Uh, she, at, at the beginning, when they did have some medicines, she took the responsibilities, make sure people get their medicines on time. Just in the beginning, they, they went uh, over pretty pretty fast, but uh, thing like this. So, so she tried to be active as much as possible in order to give meaning to the time there and, and not to think about this and here, I have nothing to do. So this is what you do. Someone had these wounds because one of the men that was with her on the way when they took, they took him on a motorcycle and they crashed twice on the way to Gaza because the, the, the men that drove the motorcycle drove very fast and they crashed. And he was wounded in his hands. So she makes sure every day she put him new bandages and make sure she's okay. She helped uh, two other women to go to the bathroom when they need it. And you were saying that your mother uh, did her very best, as I'm assuming all the hostages do, to fill up their day. And as you said, to do it in a meaningful way. They must have been very long days. Yes. And, and, and the fact is that they didn't know the time. So they didn't have their watches and, and there is no light. They didn't see sunlight for the whole 49 days. So you don't know if exactly if it's day or night and everything. You know it just according to the the meals that are, the, the prisoners uh, gave them. Or uh, sometimes they ask what the time is and they told them if someone had to take his medicine or something. But you don't know if it's been 15 minutes or three hours since the last time you knew the time. Because they didn't have any any information, any any way to do it. Yeah, so it's, it's everything is longer, but but they they told him yeah it's you know and people used to sleep also during the day if you don't have a lot to do, so the time the day and night are got mixed and and it's not really clear when, when it was day when it was night. Was your was your mom depressed or sad to a large extent for a while when she came out? Uh, no, fortunately for us, my mother took it as a very empowering experience, and, yeah, and she said. I survived this. I'm I'm stronger woman, and and um, I'm better than them. And then she took it as a very empowering thing, not as a something that uh, depressing and something like this. And and did that surprise you at all? Uh, a bit, because I saw others. No, no, I know my mother, and and it's 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 possible for her to happen it. But we saw many other women that are also very strong women before, and and uh, they took it different. So. I'm just happy that she managed to took it this way, and and let's say I'm hoping the trauma will never uh, will never come, for the last and of the days that will be in in a long time from now. How, how is she been since she's been home? Is her day just normal now? Well, it's not really normal because you know people cannot go back to live in the kibbutz. The kibbutz is is destroyed. Need to rebuild. So the day is not really normal, and now all the community is in a. In a city, so it's a different life to live in the city in a building, a 12, 13 floors building, and not in the in the house of the kibbutz. But uh, she's feeling her days. Uh, sometimes she meets friends. Sometimes she has some uh, tests to do. Sometimes she, have, but yeah, she's she's trying to be part of the community and to feel her days. And when you see her and you hug her, are your hugs are your hugs stronger than they used to be? I think yes. I think they are yes. Yes, you, you, you always say you cannot appreciate something until you lost it, and yes. then we lost her and got her back, so you can appreciate it more. Yes. Now she saw um, the 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 leader, if you will, of Hama Sinwar. Um, yes. Somehow she she saw him and and had a discussion with him. That's bizarre. What? How did that unfold? After one or two days, he came to the to the where they are in the tunnel, and uh, he came with the many bodyguards. And then they, he asked them, "Do you know who I am?" And then my mother said, "I know you are. You're Yichye uh, Sinwar." And he said, "Yes, you're right." And he said, "Don't worry. We are not. Uh, um, we don't want to hurt you. We just want you for uh, do some exchange with our prisoners." And that's it. It was very short, a five minute thing. It's not that they were. Had a long discussion or something. Did she comment on meeting somebody who is so infused with evil? I don't think she she knew back then how evil was even on that day. She was taking right in the beginning, so she didn't know back then. She didn't know about all the destruction and the killing and the horrors that happened on October seventh. So, but she, she just knew that many people were kidnapped because she saw many people. But that's it. All that's all she know. 
she knew back then. So then we have that's one piece of your life. The yes. the other piece of your life is uh, is your dad. Yes. And your dad is uh, Gadi Moses, and he was, as we said before, was was kidnapped on October seventh. I am uh, very fixated. I, I think a lot about the courage of our Israeli brothers and sisters. And I was talking to my son. I took him to school this morning. And as we discussed before, you and I, he, he came out of the safe room in order to show the terrorists that, that he was the only one in the house. And yes. I asked you, if you were at all surprised at his courage, you, you said, no, my sons asked me, he said, daddy, was that a good idea that he came out? Perhaps he should have stayed in there and he would have been okay. And my response to him was, these are Israeli brothers and sisters. They're, they're, they're grown, they're bred, they're, they're raised to show bravery. And um, your father is a very, very courageous man and a very brave man. And I, uh, I just, just wanted. It's not a question. It's just something that I wanted to share with you because we here in the diaspora, Yair, we look at people such as your father, and um, we're in absolute awe of their character and of their personality. Um, very amazing people. So thank you. thank you for giving us that inspiration. Thank you. There are many people that were really, really heroes on that day that saved yeah. other people's life and sacrificed themselves. Uh, you can mention uh, Chaim Perry that uh, last week was announced that he died, was dead in captivity, and we know that he was alive there. And he did the same. He, When the terrorists came near the, the door, he pushed the door on them and then went outside to save his, to, his, to, to protect the, the life of his uh, wife that she was hiding in the safe room. And then they took him and left her. So yeah, the same. There, there are many, many stories like this that people that were heroes and and uh, sacrificed themselves in order to protect others. Your your dad seems like a really fascinating fellow. Uh, one of your family members said that he's the type of uh, saba, the type of grandfather, the type of man that everybody wants in their family. And I think your uh, uh, niece commented on how he would at a, a 78, 79 years old. He would climb up into a tree to try to loosen a fruit um, for you know a family member. He's, he's so deeply loved. He's such an interesting fellow, your father. Yes, yes, he is. You know, um, uh, I, I knew it before. For for example, all my my kids' friends, whenever we came to the kibbutz, uh, if it was a holiday or something like this. Uh, for them, he was a Sabagadi, grandfather Gadi, because it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a brand. It's not just a person uh, that he will. And he, he was able to talk to anyone. If it's a group of kindergarten kids or a group of professor, he knew to talk to their level and explain everything and had the patient to answer all questions and, 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 and always love to put his head into the ground and show them how potatoes come outside of the ground. It's not something that come in the bag to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you put your hands into the ground and show them and, and to pull out carrots and things like this, which is very, for someone that doesn't grow up in the kibbutz or in the, in the village, it's very, it's amazing to see that you see the green leaves and take them out and you see carrots. It's not such a thing from cartoons, it's real life. And, and, and he always loved to, to explain to people and to help people whenever he could. This is what he is loved to do. He's, he's a, yes, yeah, he's an amazing person. And even though he was, 79 now he turned 80 while he was in captivity but he even the saturday before that uh, before october 7 we went to the kibbutz and we had to take uh, we went to the fields like every time to pick up some potatoes and things and we needed to, to take a box and we got to the box uh, the big thing when they are and immediately before i could even start he climbed on it and bring brought out one of the boxes to take it out and we told him it's you don't need to i'm here my son is here you don't need to climb uh, but it, it's so basic inside him, so it's something that he cannot stop doing it. So, do you do you, do you have strong memories of when you were a kid working with him in the field? Yes, we used to to go uh, many times. We you know, uh, for example, when when they uh, pick up the the peanuts, uh, so there is a very big machine that the tractor is pulling out and is separating the peanuts from the from the leaves. Yes, and. 
whenever the operator does it, he loves to, to be on the back of it to see everything is working. But usually it's one person. So after school, I used to come there. Uh, the tractor is going very, very slow. I used to hold the wheel. And he was walking around to see that uh, everything is okay. You just, you know, you just keep it in the in the line or something like this. Uh, but yeah, we used to do it all the time uh, to be with him in the fields, even if it's, it's to to open the water to see the fields are uh, irrigation is okay or whatever it is. It's a very interesting thing about children who live on a farm or or who are a part of agriculture in a kibbutz is that you get to drive very early on, as you're saying, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and for you as a kid, it's very exciting to to be able to hold the wheel, even though it's not really driving or something, just going slow in the tractor in the in the side of the field. But yes, it's it's exciting for you and it's good for him. So everybody enjoys it. Yes. You know, you you hear from people that Hamas has no idea of the quality of individuals whom they have kidnapped. Uh, it's a strange thing to say, but there is some truth in it as well. Your father worked for many years with Mashav. Yes. And Mashav is an organization within Israel that travels throughout the world to help others develop what Israel has developed, in the case of your father, agriculture. So your father traveled to Papua New Guinea. Your father traveled to Jordan. And his whole goal was to make their lives better. That was a big part of his life, right? Exactly. He did it for more than 30 years now. I think almost 35 years, the last 35 years he used to do it, uh, since the early 90s, yes. And, and then he used to go to Georgia, he used to go to to Africa, to many places, and, and really did it from, from through believing that this will improve their lives. And um, we've been to, my sister and I, we went to Georgia and, uh, when it was a Independence Day for Israel. And what happened there that the... the the ambassador invited us for a ceremony they did there about opening a new garden for Israel and Georgia relations. And many, many people that he worked with came there to, to honor him and, and pray for his release. And it's people that didn't see him for six or seven years or even more. And they care about him so much. So they they had the they felt the need to come from all over Georgia to Tbilisi in order to to honor him and, and make sure continue to the to the praise for his release because it was very important to them and after that was a big meal that everyone talked about how much he helped them and everything and and this is when i realized really i, I we knew he traveled around the world but then we saw exactly the impact he has on 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 the people that were when he went to and, and explained them even in egypt he worked for several years he went to egypt to to teach them how to grow better potatoes he was a world expert in growing potatoes he is a world expert so, Yair, do you think uh, often, or at all perhaps, uh, about the juxtaposition between those savage people who came into the kibbutz and the terror uh, that they actualized versus the beauty of your father, a wonderful soul? Like, how are you dealing with life in general nowadays, knowing the extremes of humankind and, and, and our behavior? Um, it's very hard to understand how people can be so cruel, so vicious, and, and not only in the rules. Uh, everyone heard the stories from the Nova Festival and and other places uh, that they went to in and the other kibbutzim. The, the the no one can understand how you how a human being can do these things. It's impossible even to to imagine it, to understand it. It's not something I can 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 explain, can understand what what. How can someone be so so evil so to do this, these things? It's impossible for me to understand it. Your father's uh, partner in life was, was Efrat. Yes. Uh, she was taken by Hamas terrorists on October 7th, and she was murdered by them. Her body was found two days later in a field. What, what was she like, uh, Yair? Oh, she was an amazing woman. She was a very, very gentle woman and, and very clever. You can always talk, talk with her about anything. Uh, uh, she cared a lot about uh, about everyone. Of course, my father had daughters and her grand, grandkids were, were her life. was so, so care about them. Um, she was very, very good uh, woman. Very good woman, yes. 
What, what was her uh, interest in life? What did she do? What was her passion? She also worked in agriculture. She was an uh, expert in uh, pestiments and, and to find how to, to find these uh, little animals that destroy the agriculture and, and find a way to, to kill them. But uh, she was uh, someone of, of beauty. She, she, she and my father, they have a very beautiful garden around their house. They love everything to be very neat, very nice, very yeah. organized. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She a lot of uh, small things that make the the house very, very beautiful. She always managed to, to make things. Things. Everything you came to her house, everything is clean. Everything is is neat in its place. It's not something you know. It's not a messy house or something like this. How long were they together? Uh, almost twenty years. You were at the funeral. Yes, of course. We went to the funeral. Well, well, uh, who eulogized her? Who did the hesped? Um, a daughter. She had one of the daughters, which is still in. A, it, it's it's a strange story, you know. A, a, one of her daughters had his family, and they lived in New Rose. Yeah. But exactly, they went to that Saturday. They went to her husband's family, and the other daughter that doesn't live in New Rose okay. came to visit her grandmother. So the other daughter, uh, she she was there, and, and and there was a big family that was there and and they all came together and, and were very sad together yes very yeah here yeah, i guess you think about the um you know uh you, you're familiar with victor frankel he wrote a book called a man's search for meaning it's a classic book he, I, was, I know. he was in auschwitz and while he was in auschwitz there are a number of things that kept him going one was the love for his wife and that was something that he thought about a lot with hope that when he would get out of Auschwitz, that he would reunite with his wife. There's there's a huge likelihood that your father does not know that uh, Efrat is gone. Would that be accurate? We, we cannot tell. We don't you know. Just... No one of the release hostages saw him, so we don't know anything about his condition. We don't know if he saw news or not. Uh, we don't know anything. So we just hope... Uh, we try to send messages when we talk on the radio and everything to say we are okay, we are strong with everything. But from the other side, we did talk to the, at least at the beginning about the fraud that what happened. So if you heard the news, you know, you know that she's dead, but everybody else are okay. And if he didn't, but we don't know. We really, really don't know. I, I guess what I'm asking you is there's so many difficult ethical things that you have to deal with. There's a, one of the four uh, hostages that were just saved. I think on that morning his father died. Yes, exactly. Yes. So therefore they had to tell him, you know, yes, Achi, yeah. your your father has passed away today. Yes, yes, it's, it's terrible. That's the intensity of life that you guys are dealing with. Yeah, it's we have many stories like this. This is the last one, yeah. But in, you know, he was so happy that he was released, and then yeah. after a few hours, they told him uh, when we came to tell it to your father, we were realized your father is is dead. So it's it's terrible. Also, one of our friends, um, Liat Atziri, that she was in hostage, and, and then she came back, and, and it was a very, very happy day. She came also in, on, the, on back in, in the end of November, and the day after she came back, uh, they announced that her, her husband, Aviv Atziri, he was murdered on that Saturday. Yeah. And, and Aviv was, was a friend of mine. We grew up together in the kibbutz of my age, and we hoped so much that he's okay. And then we heard this news. So it was also a very, very emotional roller coaster that we were happy that she came back. And then the next day we heard that he's died, murdered. And it was again very, very sad uh, day. Is there a sense amongst uh, families of hostages that one situation is worse than the other? When you get together for a uh, protest, as an example, will you hug uh, another family member because their situation? Uh, you know, my 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 situation's bad, but uh, you're having a tougher time than I am. Is does that happen amongst you? No, we don't compare. I don't think there is a place to comparison, and and we all in the same under the same trouble. And it's it's really really doesn't matter if it's a someone is thirty, someone is eighties, a woman, a man. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't yeah. matter. We all now we are all one big family, and and we hug each other like a family. And, and no one think uh, his situation is worse than mine, but then someone came back, so now I'm worse than him. No, it's it's not like this at all. Well, one of the things I think that we in the diaspora are very envious of 
having to do with Israel and the people there is that when there is achdut, when there is unity, it is so warm, it is so close, it really sets the bar for what family is supposed to be. I'm assuming that uh, the the other family members of hostages and you, that type of relationship, it must run so deeply now. Yes, uh, you know it's 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 uh, variant. Without some of the families, it, it's my new brothers. Yeah, and with others, they just said hello. It's it's and 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 everything in the middle. So, you know, like like in real life, you know, not all your family members are your closest friend, <laughs> right. and not right. with all of them you talk every day. And and some of them you just once a year say happy new year and that's it. And some of them you're happy to see them every time you can. And and it's the same with 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 this. You know, the the variety of families here are. All, all over Israel, and all the kind and all the the different thoughts and opinion and everything. And with some of them, you you find the better common uh, common things, and with others less. You just said hello, uh, thing, and that's it. But yeah, for many, with the many of them, we are like, uh, uh, in any case, with all of them, we are one big family now, and and uh, we care for all of the families. We we talked before about Efrat, and as we mentioned. Um, her daughter, Daron Katz Asher, was visiting the kibbutz on October 7th with her two little ones, Ruz and Aviv. What is Doron like? What sort of person is she? She's a very interesting person, very nice, very open-hearted. It, it's, we can always talk with her. Uh, um, she's younger than me in several years, and we don't, we are not close, uh, we weren't close uh, like this in a way that we had a lot of time together but from all the time we managed to meet it was very very nice to meet there um she's very smart uh, we can talk about anything together now the, that's an example of uh, a family whereby little kids were taken hostage right yes yes yeah do you have any sense of how they're doing the little ones uh, they're struggling, but they're being uh, covered from all over and taking care of and, and getting worried. And, and from time to time, they're still talking. And, you know, they, they lost their grandmother. They're, my father for them is like a real grandpa from, for all their life. They know him as the person that lived with the with their grandmother and, and they call him grandpa and everything. So they miss him a lot. And also they lost um, um, their own brother. Uh, that Ravid Katz it was also made that Saturday, so they also miss him. So it, it's very hard. They, they understand the situation as much as a two and a four years old girls can understand. And sometimes they talk about the bad people that came and everything. But they're being taken care of and, and making sure they are uh, all hugged and everything is. How how are they being taken care of? With psychologists, with the treatment, with with everything that is possible to do. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that um, when you're together with them, it must be just so hard, just in your mind, to think about what they've gone through being so little. Yes, of course it is. Um, you know, I think that thanks to that, that they're so little, for them it was a bad experience, but they really didn't really understand the situation. Uh, Doron uh, told us that how it was she couldn't even allow herself to go to the bathroom when she didn't know what if they will be back when when she come back if they will be there or not for some sometimes she was so worried about it so in the time they were just by themselves she she couldn't go quite to the battle when in other times where she was with other people she was a bit less concerned because someone or someone else that can watch them other other uh, hostages i mean but yeah it was it's very hard i think thanks to the fact that they are so small that didn't really understand the, the whole situation and, and what happened there. Yeah, you're, you're a father. Has your fatherhood changed at all since October 7th? Um, I don't know. I don't know if we managed to to process it and understand it. You know, for now on, we're just trying to to live another day and, and do whatever we can do. So, of course, uh, my kids are also very aware of the situation. They miss the grandfather, of course. <coughs> and they are worried and everything, and, and we try to also to help them and whenever it's possible. Um, I don't know to say if, if I've changed or not because I didn't really get the time to to really process what happened to me. I'm 
and li I'm still living it. Your son was to have a bar mitzvah uh, yes. on the 19th of October, but he said, I don't want it. No. When, when it's after it's happened, uh, uh, we thought about it, uh, and, and he said, uh, I don't want to. We, we planned a big celebration in the hotel and everything with all the family will come, and then we realized it cannot be. And then we told them, okay, let's do something small, just as family, maybe a few of your friends that you go to the Torah because you practice so much and you learn and everything. And he said, no, I cannot do it without my father. A bar mitzvah is very important. Need to be one big celebration. And I want my father, my grandfather to be there. So we are waiting and, and we'll do it when he'll be back. Yeah, you're probably familiar with the, uh, with the level of anti-Semitism that we're <laughs> experiencing here. And uh, one of the things that I ask my guests, be they Jewish or not Jewish, um, why why do you think that the Jewish people are hated so much? I I really don't know. I cannot explain it. I really really don't don't know why. It's it's uh, you know it's very easy to find someone to blame all the faults of the world, but it's it's so untrue. So it's impossible to understand why people behaving like this it's for me it's a it's an unknown i cannot understand it uh, why people can think that uh, this is a legit thing that can be happen <coughs> and and why people shouting that they, they shouldn't be back and and tearing off the the posters and everything i i cannot understand this really really cannot understand what drive people to do it your cousin did an interview and she said that she was just so incredibly hurt by that, seeing the videos of people tearing down the posters. Yes, because the same, you know, what what gives you the why? Why does it bother you? Why do you think it's not it's 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 not it's okay to do something like this? It's not it's not even posted that's against someone. It says, help me, my my relative was kidnapped. Uh, just to be people to know that it's happened and you know to tear it off it's like hiding say it didn't happen uh, why do you think trying to say something like this didn't happen it's happened and it's true and and say it didn't happen won't make it disappear it's it's the truth that terrorists came inside and, and murdered and, and kidnapped so many people kids women elderly men it's not soldiers you know uh, even against soldier it's, it's terrible but they came to people on Saturday morning to their beds, took them in the pajamas, sometimes barefoot, and kidnapped them to, to underground to tunnels. How can this, can you legit this? How can you not protest against it? It's impossible to understand. Can we have peace one day with our enemies? I really, really want to believe it, but it's very, very hard to believe for day. Many, many people like me that believed it, uh, now it's it's very very hard to to keep this belief because uh, you don't understand you know it's not just soldiers that came there the the Nukba, which are mercenaries uh, uh, we know that in in Rose and other places women and children came and participated in this so who is innocent I don't know who is innocent when people talk about the innocent people in Gaza it's very hard to understand who is innocent a family that kept uh, um, a woman in, in their houses for the all eight months, are they innocent? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very hard to understand who's innocent. And, and we need it will take, a, I believe, many, many years until they will understand that their life will be better if, if they go to peace and not to war. At, at the moment, it's very, very hard to believe it will happen uh, in, in a near or even far future. Yeah, here, what can we do uh, here in the diaspora for your father and the other hostages? Um, talk about it. Tell everyone. People need to understand that this is the still happening. And and whoever shouting ceasefire and stop the war need to understand if they want the war to be stopped, they need the support of the release of the hostages. This is the only thing that will stop the war in Gaza. Not anything else. They, they need to understand. You, you want that the uh, bombs in Gaza will stop? You're afraid about the people there? Well, it's it's your opinion, but if you want it to stop, support the release of the hostages, and then it will stop. This is the only thing, because Israel cannot allow them to stay there, and Israel will do whatever it can in order to release them. So if you want it to stop, make sure that they support the release of the hostages. Yair, it's a pleasure to meet you. You're a lovely human being.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate your time. And I can only imagine how difficult these interviews must be for you and the other family members. And I wish you well. You've gone through a lot. Your family has gone through a lot. And as they say in Hebrew you, or Jewish, you should all the rest of your days um, should be uh, smachot, should be celebrations. Yes. And your father should come home as soon as tomorrow. God bless him. Of course, of course. Thank you. And, and it's very important for us to be able to talk uh, to people all around the world to hear us. And, and this is why we do this effort, because it's so important to people to know this is still happening and we need them to be back. And, and it's too much time, 250 days, it's 51. It's even impossible to imagine this amount of days, more than eight months. Um, thank you so much, Yair Moses, for being with us. And I appreciate everybody watching and everybody uh, listening. Please heed um, what Yair is saying, which is to talk much about the hostages, who they are. I think it's really important that we understand their characters, their personalities, as we attempted to do in this interview and share it with uh, as many others as you possibly can, both Jew and non-Jew. And God willing, um, they should be released uh, immediately and uh, we should forge ahead uh, toward peace. Yeah, Ear Moses, thank you so much. And uh, God bless you and your family. Thank you. Thank you very much.